Welcome to the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, for the talk today. Well, thanks everybody for coming today. I'm going to kick things off with the talk. We had a little bit of change to the schedule. So this is a topic that was requested and I'm going to do my best to cover. The topic today is dual antiretroviral therapy or using just two antiretroviral agents to treat HIV. What do we know about this so far? And subtitle, what do we need to know to feel comfortable using just two drugs? So here's what I'll talk about. Data for two drugs for initial therapy, data for two drugs for maintenance and salvage, and then ongoing clinical trials. So as you know, the standard for many years has been three drug antiretroviral therapy, three active drugs, and that has been shown to be effective to reduce the risk of resistance, and that's been our paradigm for many, many years. Now, with potent agents like certain protease inhibitors like dolutegravir, that paradigm is being reassessed in a way, and the question has come that if using these potent agents, can we get away with just two drugs, or there's some studies looking at even less. I'm not going to cover monotherapy data today. Why is this being considered? Well, in theory, dual antiretroviral treatment could minimize toxicity by using less agents. There is a lot of interest in certain areas like in Europe and other parts of the world because of reduced cost. Maybe in theory we could preserve future options. Question, would adherence be better with only two drugs versus three? I don't know. We're not usually looking at reducing pill burden here because we have so many one and two pill a day options, but maybe by minimizing toxicity we can promote better adherence. So these are some of the reasons this is now being looked at. What I'll do is I'll show you what's in the guidelines now and then the data for using two drugs first for initial therapy, then for maintenance or salvage therapy, and I'll do my best to provide a summary and my interpretation, which may not be the same as your interpretation. So here's what's in the Department of Health and Human Services guidelines. They list as, quote, other regimens to consider for initial therapy if TAF, TDF, and abacavir cannot be used. These two options, boosted darunavir plus raltegravir, with the caveat that this should only be considered if the viral load is below 100,000 or the CD4 above 200, and we'll talk about why, or boosted lopinavir, which is Kaletra, plus 3TC, which is lamivudine. And then they list as the reason why this might be considered the example of a patient with significant renal insufficiency, I guess I'm adding the term significant because TAF, of course, can be given down to a creatinine clearance of 30, but significant renal insufficiency plus a contraindication to a abacavir is a situation where you might consider this. So this might be a person with renal disease and a positive B5701, or renal disease plus a history of ischemic heart disease. You may want to avoid both tenofovir products and abacavir. Now, I have to say, and I've mentioned this here before, I'm a little surprised these made it into the guidelines. I cannot say I personally have ever prescribed either of these options. I think we have so many options these days. I wonder about the utility. I have used this option, boosted durinavir plus raltegavir, but I've added FTC or 3TC because I think that adds little in the way of pill burden or side effects. In the setting, for example, of someone with really bad renal disease, I have used that. I am yet to prescribe either of these two drug options. These, both of these options are also mentioned in the IAS USA guidelines with a lot of caveats. But the reason they bring up these two options, as I'll show you, is these are the two options that were included in the best powered two drug treatment studies that we have to date. So let's look at some of the data for initial therapy. And I've bolded uh, the studies that were well-powered and that led to these options being approved in the guidelines. But I'm going to start down here and just go chronologically. The first study we got of a PI plus raltegravir was called Spartan back in 2012, and it made some headlines because it didn't work well. Now, they used this unusual dose, and this is the one trial where the PI was unboosted. They used this high-dosed unboosted adizanavir plus raltegravir compared it to initial therapy with our more traditional Truvada boosted atazanavir and stopped because of more failures, more integrase resistance, and more jaundice. So that clearly did not work. 
Then the PROGRESS trial looked at boosted lopinavir, which is Kaletra plus raltegravir, compared to Kaletra plus Truvada, and actually found it did pretty darn well. And we'll come back to talk more about the Kaletra raltegravir option. But then people were really excited about the potential for boosted darunavir raltegravir as two drugs for initial therapy. And this ACTG trial and the RADAR trial both were pretty disappointing with fairly high rates of failure in the single arm ACTG trial, especially if viral loads were high at baseline. And then in the RADAR trial, which actually was a randomized comparison trial, clear, clearly inferior virologic efficacy with two drugs versus three. So initial data for darunavir raltegravir being pretty poor and disappointing, but now this is listed in the guidelines as an option to consider in unusual or unique circumstances. So why is that? That's because of this large French trial called NEAT or ANRS-143. And again, this was the best powered trial, which compared boosted darunavir to raltegravir compared to three drug boosted darunavir standard initial therapy and found the two drug option to be non-inferior. I lost my mouse, there we are. To be non-inferior with the fine print being if people had advanced disease, a low CD4 or a high viral load, it did not do well. So this is not an option I would ever consider in someone with advanced HIV infection, but because of that trial, it did make it into both of the US guidelines. Now, I won't go through this in as much detail. I'll just say that boosted PI plus Maraviroc has been studied. There was some excitement for initial therapy. This is a very potent agent, plus in individuals who are R5 tropic, which most are at initial infection, in theory, you could say this should work. It did not. It really, in all of the trials, did not work well, and it's a little bit unclear why. Now, here are things I, I think get pretty interesting. So the Gardell trial used boosted lopinavir, which is Kaletra, which is no longer on our first-line guidelines, plus BID lamivudine, so a bit of an unusual dose of lamivudine compared to Kaletra plus two standard NRTIs, and actually that did pretty darn well. However, here, at least in this country, I don't think I'd ever even consider prescribing this, given this is three pills twice a day, all of the side effects of Kaletra. There were some issues with the trial as well, but it is intriguing why that worked. And then um, this study, Paddle, which was just uh, presented at IAS in July, made some headlines because this is dolutegravir once daily plus 3TC once daily as initial therapy, so just two drugs. It was a really small pilot trial, but it did seem to work okay. There were only 20 patients. This was done in Argentina in Buenos Aires. Of those 20 patients, 90% achieved a suppressed viral load at 48 weeks. One of these uh, participants who did not, unfortunately, was a suicide, so it was not a, a true virologic failure, but was counted as a failure. And the other developed a low-level viral load, was counted as a failure, but then resuppressed without any change of therapy. So you could make the argument that more or less everyone did okay, but this is only 20 patients. But I've just told you boosted PIs and raltegravir, the data is really mixed and didn't do so well. Boosted PIs and Maraviroc did really poorly. So why now is a boosted PI and 3TC or dolutegravir and 3TC seeming to do okay? I don't know. Are there drug interactions we aren't aware of with the integrase inhibitors and Maraviroc and PIs? Is it adherence and pill burden? Is there some magic to including an NRTI with upfront therapy? I don't know the answer to that. Because of this paddle trial, there's now a larger ACTG study enrolling. They're aiming for 120 participants, and they are gonna look at this dolutegravir 3TC as initial therapy, and I think we'll get, get good data from that, hopefully. The other thing I should say is in this trial in paddle, they tried to only enroll people with viral loads under 100,000, and at enrollment, everyone had a lower viral load than that, but actually at the start of therapy, there were four people who had viral loads over 100,000 and they did okay. So this is intriguing to me, but I think we need better data before this is ready for prime time. So here's my interpretation of dual therapy for, for initial treatment. For boosted PI, like boosted darunavir plus raltegravir, I, I think the data are mixed. 
I think clearly it's not reliable if someone has a high viral load or a low CD4. I would say use with caution. Maybe there's very unique circumstances. I'd have a low threshold if using boosted darunavir, raltegravir, just to add in FTC or 3TC personally, but not everyone agrees. Boosted PI plus Maraviroc, I think clearly does not do well. And then I'm intrigued by this data for a boosted PI or dolutegravir plus 3TC, but I think we need larger trials. I'm gonna show you a little bit at the very end about the potential for cost saving here. But let's look just quickly at using two drug ART for maintenance or salvage. So here are the studies that looked at a boosted PI or the integrase inhibitor raltegravir or Maraviroc for salvage therapy. So this is someone on three drug, sorry, not salvage, I misspoke, for maintenance. So this is someone on three drug ART who has a suppressed viral load and we're simplifying to two drug therapy. This really small trial found that boosted darunavir raltegravir as opposed to staying on boosted lopinavir Truvada seemed to do okay, but it was small. But maybe this is mo more support for using boosted darunavir raltegravir as is now in the guidelines. One thing I should say about all of these maintenance or switch trials is participants are selected very carefully. So these are people who've been suppressed for a long time, not a lot of failures, no resistance to these agents no hepatitis B. I think that's an important caveat. We would not consider anyone with hepatitis B for any of these studies. But then this small trial of boosted darunavir raltegravir seemed okay. But then we go back to boosted adazanavir raltegravir. And in this trial, which was larger, it did not do well. Why is that? I, I have no idea. So we talked about Spartan, adazanavir, unboosted raltegravir for initial therapy did poorly. Now we have a switch trial to boosted adazanavir raltegravir that does pretty badly as well. I, I can't really explain that. And then the March trial, again, Maraviroc plus a boosted PI did not do well. Let's turn then to our combination with 3TC. And now, again, we seem to be doing okay. So I'm back to this question of what is the magic of 3TC? Is it drug interactions? Is it some unbeknownst benefit of NRTIs? Oh, I just don't think we know. So these three trials, and this is not an extensive list of switching to a boosted PI plus 3TC seem to do fine. So I just don't think we fully understand why. I did find a pilot study from Italy that was switching people who, with a suppressed viral load to boosted darunavir real pivorine. That seemed to do okay, but again, it was a relatively small pilot study, and I think we need more data. And then this pilot Italian study looked at maintenance, so switching to dolutegravir plus rilpivirine. So it's called the Tevedo trial for Tivike, which is dolutegravir plus Edurant, which is rilpivirine. Again, it's a small pilot observational cohort, but, but I think this is really interesting because this was not just maintenance, this was salvage. These were people with pretty extensive resistance. All had failed at least one prior regimen all had at least one class resistance, a number had multiple class resistance, and this switch to dolutegravir plus rilpivirine seemed to do okay. This came up recently in conversation about one of Bob Pell's patients who had a complicated history, extensive salvage, and a lot of intolerances, and really the only agents left were dolutegravir plus rilpivirine. So will this two drug combo do okay even for salvage therapy? This study would suggest yes. Again, I think we need more data. There are some pilot trials of 30-ish patients out of Europe, out of Spain and France of dolutegravir monotherapy for salvage, and that seems to work okay, so maybe this is plausible and makes sense, but I, I just, I'm not ready to start prescribing dolutegravir monotherapy to people with extensive resistance yet. I think we need more data. Now, I'm not showing you the data from the LATTE study, which is six months of oral therapy and then simplification to long-acting injectable cabotegravir and long-acting long injectable rilpivirine, but that also seemed to do okay and is sort of akin to this, although that's being used for initial therapy. But that's six months of oral upfront therapy, then two long-acting injectable drugs given every two months is the way it's being given going into phase three. So look out for more on that. Now, a slight curveball here, and maybe I'll come back uh, once I'm wrapped up in a minute to and ask colleagues from Namibia about this. Here are three studies of individuals with NNRTI failure 
Most of these were done in Sub-Saharan Africa that then looked at boosted lopinavir raltegravir as the second line option, especially in places where you don't have access to genotype, and it did seem to do okay. I'm having trouble with how to fit this into all the other data, but here, here are studies that boosted lopinavir raltegravir as second line did all right. So maybe I can pose the question in a minute of, do you ever use this? But we'll, we'll come back to that. To wrap up, here's my interpretation of two-drug ART for maintenance or salvage. It does seem like the combo of a boosted PI or dolutegavir, so a very potent agent plus 3TC or maybe rolpivirine seem to be promising. Maybe we can consider these in select patients, very unique circumstances, not routinely. I think we need larger, well-designed trials of modern drugs. Now, I didn't show you all of the data out there. If you're interested in this topic, I would suggest this systematic review and meta-analysis that came out this year in Lancet HIV because they list all of the trials and all of the data. This meta-analysis looked at studies of two-drug ART for either first-line therapy or switch compared to control with triple ART. And here's what they found in terms of risk of virologic failure was not much higher with first line or switch to two drug ART, but they did find a significantly higher risk of developing resistance. So their conclusion is that dual therapy, especially with regimens excluding Moravirat, could be safe and efficacious, particularly if low baseline viral load, but it may lead to greater risk of selecting resistance mutations. But if you want more on this topic, this is a great review. And then finally, Here's just food for thought. So this group from Harvard, which has done really, really thought-provoking cost-effectiveness modeling, looked at a mathematical model of what would happen with cost savings if we used dolutegavir plus 3TC either as initial therapy or as maintenance therapy for those who have become suppressed on three-drug ART. And the punchline is that if that combo ends up having greater than 90% effectiveness in clinical trials, and if we had 50% uptake of either using this two-drug combo for induction maintenance or ART-naive patients, cost savings would total 550 million and 800 million respectively within five years, and greater than 3 billion if 25% of currently suppressed patients were switched to this two drug maintenance option. So food for thought. Again, we don't have great clinical efficacy data for that trial, uh, for that combo yet, uh, but we will in the future. So here's what's coming and um, I'm excited to see data from these studies and I think these are going to add a lot um, and help inform our practice. So again, the ACTG trial of dolutegavir 3 tcs initial therapy. I also found a um, trial enrolling for boosted drunavir 3TC initial therapy, and then these simplification trials, all of which use a, um, either one or two very potent agents plus either ropivirine or 3TC, and then again, the simplification to long-acting injectable dual therapy is either in phase three or going to phase three, so look out for more on that. But I will wrap up there with these questions. Are there patients in your practice for whom you might think about two-drug ART? Are all of these two-drug ART studies worth the cost of the trials versus potential cost savings in the future? And what data or what evidence will it take for you to actually be, feel comfortable prescribing two-drug ART, sort of getting out of our paradigm of three active drugs for everyone? I don't know the answer to those questions, but I'd be curious, why don't we wrap up there and give a minute or two for questions or comments from everyone?